process. So welcome again to our Don't Waste the COVID-19 Crisis Reflections on Resilience in the Commons uh, webinar series. Uh, today we're with uh, Tina Jamore from Utrecht University. This webinar series is hosted by the Center for Behavior Institutions and the Environment at Arizona State University, the International Association for the Study of the Commons and the Resilience Alliance. So a, a bit of introduction to uh, Tina before uh, we let her take it away. Um, Tina is a professor of institutions for collective action um, in a historical perspective at uh, Utrecht University, uh, soon to be at Erasmus in Rotterdam. Um, Tina is going to speak for about uh, 40 minutes or so, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. If you have questions, please uh, write them in the Q&A uh, box um, at the bottom of your screens, and we'll go ahead and, and uh, compile those and, and send them on to Tina as we go through there. Um, so please put your questions there. Without further ado, let me turn it over to Tina. Thanks. Hi. Um, well, good evening, at least at my side, it's evening to you all. Um, yeah, I'm going to present you a talk, um, start with sharing my slides. Um, just let me share my screen. There we go. I hope people can see my presentation. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm going to tell you a bit more about commons and crisis in general but also in relation to the long-term development of commons and crisis. But before I start digging into some uh, the results of research we've done at Utrecht University, some disclaimers. Uh, to start with, this is a, a webinar not on, on about crisis on the commons, but it's about the relationship between the crisis, between types of crisis and commons. Uh, secondly, um, as I will introduce a bit later, I will explain that uh, we see commons as a pars pro toto for institutions for collective action, uh, which are a form of governance regime whereby groups of people work together to manage and, res and use resources collectively and that according to collectively set agreements, rules, etc. So commons is just one of the types of institutions for collective action I will consider. Um, second, uh, thirdly, we're, um, in this talk I'll, I'll focus mainly on the European development and that for about a thousand years of uh, history, a longitudinal perspective I will give. Uh, talking about history also means that there might be uh, things we didn't capture, there might be gaps in our data, but I'll say a bit later about that too. And lastly, um, I'm talking about crisis in general, so there's many types of crisis and many have primary and secondary consequences. Uh, on uh, the development of commons uh, over time, and I will try to sketch that. So these are, this is a bit of a context um, in the background I will be uh, dealing with. Now, um, we're of course in a very uh, fascinating and also, well, um, difficult time with the COVID-19 crisis, which is primarily, of course, a health crisis, which has severe demographic, uh, social, uh, economic, um, and other types of crisis. But at the same time, we also see that um, this also leads to higher and tenser forms of solidarity. People uh, rediscover so more or less uh, solidarity in many different forms. We also see that globalization as such is being questions, questions which, which means that um, we are questioning whether um, outsourcing production, um, long supply change, etc., are really the right way to go. And at the same time, we see renewal um, of for short chain solutions and initiatives that aim towards uh, controlling production cycles. It's something we very clearly see, for example, in agriculture in Europe right now. At the same time, we also see issues about national security, protectionism popping up. But parallel to that, we also see that there's a new detention for self-sufficiency and self-organization uh, self among citizens. They take up new initiatives to um, be, become self-sufficient. We also see that um, in the midst of state and market failure, citizens ask themselves whether they can self-organize. So these are all sort of dual developments, um, most of them connected to 
uh, the COVID-19 crisis, but some of them going on for a much longer time. These might actually be also opportunities to tackle not just this not COVID-19 crisis, but also, for example, uh, the crisis that's still awaiting us due to climate change. Now, these are very recent developments. Um, we've seen minds to some extent, some extent changing, behavior also uh, we've seen changing to some extent, but in the meanwhile, already for quite a while, we've seen another development taking place, and that's sort of the revival of the commons, you would call it. Now, as I said in the disclaimers, I'm, I'm focusing here mainly on Europe. That's the area I know best. And in Europe, we've seen over the past 15, 20 years, more or less, an enormous development of new types of commons. We call them also citizen collectivities um, or institutions for collective action, as I will do in most of the talk. And what is interesting is that we see them appearing in basically every sector, from care to energy, and in between um, also consumer co-ops, uh, collectivities that aim towards um, managing public greens, etc. Very fascinating development. Uh, and quite a few people put it all together and say it's a huge development. That's true. There's a sort of new movement that we can see in Europe of citizens building their own commons, so to speak. But there is also a lot of variety uh, among these um, collectivities. Some of them are actually reacting to the lack of the provisions, like in care. You see them, this is just a map of the Netherlands, and you see that the, co the, the care collectivities emerge, in particular in areas where the um, provision of care is, is very, very basic. The market does not develop there, and the government does not provide. Whereas you also see the huge development of energy cooperatives across Europe, which is driven mainly by the opportunities that people have to set up their own mills, invest in solar cells, and also actually consider it as a good investment that will uh, give return on investment in due time. And in between this, many varieties of, well, either uh, born out of misery or born out of opportunity, I would say. So this development has been going on on the background. So this is not something new. We've seen it in many countries in Europe since the beginning of the 21st century, more or less. Now, all these types of collectivities we consider them as institutions for collective action. Just to give you a bit of a more abstract uh, way of thinking about it, what these institutions for collective action or these citizen collectivities are, are um, basically collectivities of people who become members of a group and they decide to govern and use resources together. So they consider the resources they have as a collectivity. They don't have their individual Parts know it's a collectivity of resources. But when you put a group of people together with a collectivity of resources and services they can provide, then you get easily what is called a social dilemma. A social dilemma which needs to be solved. Otherwise, people might take, uh, prefer their short-term individual gains over the long-term collective gains. And that's when they build an institution. That's when they come up with rules. And if we want to, um, if, if, if this group of people aims to become resilient, they have to take into account the interaction between the group of members, the resources they manage, and the institution that basically uh, tries to solve the social dilemma. That's when we talk about different factors that interact, utility, equity, and efficiency. I will say a bit more as parameters to evaluate the resilience of these institutions later on. Now, what is interesting is that this is not just a governance model, um, in an abstract way, but has, has had over time many different applications. Over the past, uh, yeah, many different applications whereby members can be owners, consumers, laborers, producers, investors even. Um, they can uh, invest in, or they can become a member of institutions like commons, cooperatives, mutuals, to say a bit more about that in a moment. And the resources they can govern are very diverse as well. So it's basically a governance model that has been applied in that many different domains, many different sectors. Now, if we look throughout history, we see that um, these different types, uh, these different applications come back in what we call archetypes of institutions for collective action that have evolved over time. For example, we see um, Marx and, and uh, agricultural commons. We see guilds. And I now notice that it's still in Dutch, 
but uh, the writing in English is more or less the same. Uh, we see guilds, that so those are collectivities of craftsmen in the early modern period. And in the 19th century, we see labor unions emerging, cooperatives and agriculture, but also in banking emerging, also water boards and mutual insurance. So you see a huge variety of these types of institutions evolving over time. Now these archetypes, we'll say a bit more about that in a moment. Um, I will, in the, the rest of the talk, basically offer you an analysis on two levels of um, the functioning of these institutions for collective action. The macro perspective, their function on the, the broader evolution uh, of these institutions, I try to connect it to crises over time, over the past thousand year, years. Uh, so the macro perspective focuses on these different types of um, institutes for collective action. Then I will show you some results we've, uh, on the basis of, of the analysis we've done uh, on the micro perspective. And that will allow me um, to dig a bit, dig a bit deeper uh, into the data and show you what the effects are of crisis. Now, I can already disclose some of the results to you. On the macro perspective, um, you will see that um, there is some effect of demographic growth, but not necessarily of um, demographic crisis on the emergence of, the, of these different types of institutions for collective action over time. But when it comes down to the dissolution of these institutions, so when they disappear, as they did in history, I will show, then you see that mainly government action has effect. So basically over time, in the evolution of these institutions, we don't really find an effect of various types of crises. On the micro perspective, it's actually a bit similar. Um, when we look at the, uh, the organization level, we see that these organizations are quite capable of remaining, uh, re becoming resilient. Um, and they, they, are, they can manage to go on for a very long time throughout history. Um, but we don't really see crises, and there were quite a few, um, reflected in the, actual in the actual rules. There is stress uh, on, the, on the resources, but we don't really see the sort of crisis on the commons uh, happening. So apparently they were able to deal with different types of crises. So let's move on. So as I said, I'll first give a bit of an idea of what happens with long-term transitions and its effect on the emergence of different types of institutions for collective action. Now here you see um, the long-term uh, evolution of, of various types over the past thousand, thousand years, various types of archety archetypes of institutions for collective action. And um, what we know is that there has actually been periods of various waves of institutions for collective action. That's what the ICA stands for. So we first see a wave around 1300 to 1500 of well, a very rapid growth of different types of institutions for collective action. And those come after rapid population growth, which went together with the great reclamations period may, around 1000, 1200. So you see population growth after that commercialization. And basically these institutions are being set up to regulate uh, the resource distribution, both in the countryside as in the cities. Now, a second wave takes place um, after those of the first wave that disappeared end of 18th, early 19th century. The second wave takes place around 1880, 1920, again, after a period of population growth from 1750 onwards, more or less, depending a bit on the country. Now, the third wave that might be taking place today of formation of new institutions for collective action um, does not necessarily have to do with population growth, but with the effects of uh, commercialization and privatization that we have witnessed over the past 30, 40 years. Now, um, yes, okay. So if we look at the evolution of these archetypes, I've just said when they emerged, uh, what the, the causes were in general terms, it's been basically after a period of intense population growth and the consequences of that, like commercialization, privatization of goods, etc. But when they come to an end, these waves, um, it's not because of population changes. Uh, they're, they're, in the past, we've seen various reasons why they disappeared. When the first wave of institutional collective action 
sort of stopped. And when those institutions were dissolved, there was an exogenous, uh, an, an, uh, sorry, an ex exogenous, it should be the other way around, an exogenous uh, cause for the disappearance. The exogenous cause being that governance um, dissolved these institutions for collective action towards the end of the 18th to early 19th century. Some of them did it a bit later during the, their, the 19th century, but uh, overall, most of these institutions were dissolved top down. So we see exogenous reasons for their disappearance. Now the second wave sees more endogenous reasons. When we see fewer cooperatives or fewer mutuals popping up, that's mainly because they've merged in larger units. They've merged into larger organizations. So um, rather than setting up new institutions, the ones that already existed merged and became larger as units. Now what is interesting to notice here is that over time, uh, when one type of uh, one type of institution disappeared and another uh, type popped up a few decennia later, you do see that the functions they had, the main functions they had, were transferred. So the importance of commons in the early modern period in the agricultural sense was mainly in pooling production capital. So bringing uh, together uh, pasture land, for example, but also natural resources as an important uh, contribution to the, the farming system. Now this has been transferred into ag agricultural cooperatives in the late 19th century. They have more or less the same function. Same for guilds. When we see, when we look at them in the early modern period, they mainly have, well, one of the functions they have is insurance. This function is taken over by mutuals in the uh, 19th and 20th century. The same goes for sort of subdivision of Guilds. It's a sort of formation of, of uh, um, well, laborers of, of guilds. Um, they they join. They form a, a sort of sub guild at some point and from the 16th century onwards, and later on move on to the labor union. So you do see they disappear, but their functions remain. Uh, live. They, they live on in another um, type of institutional collective. Okay. So basically, what we've seen so far is that. Um, the crisis as such has had not much of an effect on uh, the, the appearance and the disappearance of, um, of uh, institutions for collective action. And the causes um, we've seen for the disappearance of the first wave were exogenous, but enforced by the government. The second wave, basically, uh, they, they became larger organizations that didn't dissolve as such. Now, when we go a level deeper, we can look a bit more into detail what, what a crisis really does to an institution for collective action, such as, for example, um, the commons in the agricultural historical sense. Um, and when I use the term common here in this context, I refer to exactly that type of institution, uh, an institution set up by farmers in the early modern period aimed towards um, collective management of pasture land, woodland, peatland, etc., mainly in order to achieve a more efficient resource management um, and also to prevent over harvesting due to well, very rapid population uh, growth. So better management could lead to more efficient use um, and usually, well, most of the people in the village have access, not all, um, but it's, it's a sort of um, a way to keep the mixed agriculture system they had in the early modern period alive, even under demographic pressure. Now, um, when we look at the uh, evolution of new commons in uh, an agricultural area in the Netherlands, uh, it's the eastern part of the Netherlands, this is just a part for which we could retrieve the data, and this is historical data, so it, it can be quite hard to find uh, information on the emergence, functioning, and dissolution of these commons. But for this area, we could do this uh, for about, um, well, for, for quite a few commons, 800 in total. And some of them we could include in our um, analysis when we knew the emergence and the solution date. Now, when we look at the graph underneath, you see that um, there is a rapid growth of new types of commons in particular from the 13th, but definitely from the 14th and 15th century onwards. Now the great reclamation period is a bit before that. So 1000 to 1200, you see population growth. And at some point in 13th 
the turning 40s, you see a massive demographic shock in, uh, all over Europe because of the Black Death. We don't really see that. Um, we don't really see that it has an effect on the emergence of new types of commons. Quite to the contrary, actually, it's quite at that point when new commons emerge. So, no real effect of demographic shocks here. Now, with the data you see here, we can also look into uh, the regulation of commons, and I'll say a bit more about that later about our analysis. But we'll start first stay on the uh, sort of the, 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 the macro level here to have a look at the geographical spread of new commons. So as I said, it's a consequence of demographic growth, of pressure on the agricultural land, also due to commercialization. So they have to set up resource management systems in order to prevent overuse and, and bad management of pasture land, etc. And here you see uh, the new commons emerging step by step. So this is the period that they emerge. Right? And this is the period when you see them, uh, the, so the, the, the bottom part of the, uh, the figures, you see them disappear again. And here you see that um, they actually emerge in a, in, from various areas. Uh, so there's no real central location where they emerge from. It's really a bottom-up evolution whereby farmers uh, decide to set up this type of common. And they do so until a sort of saturation point. At some point, nearly every village has its own common or they share one with other villages. So there's enough commons and then you see that it, the saturation point is um, reached. But actually there's no centralized model of this Persian. This also confers our, our suspicion that um, most of these commons really did not communicate with each other. Uh, they, they basically um, worked individually within each village we don't also we don't see proof that they, for example, copied each other's regulations. So basically, they they responded um, in each village by setting up their own common, but they didn't form an alliance or a network with all these other commons. Um, they were quite well individual. This also explains why in the 9th, 18th, late 18th, early 19th century, they could dissolve so massively all um, at once. What we see here underneath is, and the same actually on the right-hand side, is the effect of the top-down dissolution, uh, the governments, uh, the, in this case, the Dutch government um, had on, on the common. So mostly, most commons disappeared because of the laws of 1810, 1830, or 1835, which aimed to dissolve the commons in the Netherlands. And they actually had an effect. Only very few commons survived this period. Now, what is interesting is that you see a very wide variety of uh, lifespans of commons. So some of them um, emerged much earlier uh, or, and, and survived for hundreds and hundreds of years. Others only survived for a few, uh, well, for a few decennia. But all of them disappeared at the end of the 18th, early 19th century. Some actually survived until the 20th century, but those are very few. Uh, there's a very, those are very rare examples. So in here we can actually um, clearly demonstrate that uh, the crisis on the commons here was actually caused by the legislation by uh, the Dutch government. It was not connected to any type of natural resource uh, disaster or a demographic disaster. It was purely the consequence of legislation. Okay. Well, over time, we see, of course, that um, many different crises take place in, in a rural society like the one we're discussing here. This is just a sort of temporal overview of the types of crises and when you find them over time. Here, you, the blue dots, you see the legislation uh, that really led to the extinction of those commons. But you see that basically, more or less the whole time, there was some sort of crisis either um, uh, climate crisis or storms or warfare, um, plagues, so dem which had a great demographic impact, but also cattle plagues, which could kill the whole herd, um, agricultural disasters like, um, you know, bad harvests, etc. If you keep in mind this picture, and then we have a, um, we, we actually, um, we'll show it later, but you, do, you actually find very little effect of these 
um, of this crisis over time. Now let's go a bit back to um, the, the figure I showed in the beginning. As I said, um, the institutions are there to sort of moderate the effect of a social dilemma, to sort of help uh, the commoners to um, overcome that social dilemma. And here is when we, we try to understand what these elements, utility, equity, and efficiency do for these commons. Now, um, the institutions on the one hand, try to, as we, well, as most common scholars know, there's rules in there in, in the regulation that actually try to deal with access and management uh, to the resources by the members. So what defines a member is defined in the rules. And you find rules on the use and monitoring of the resources. So these access and management rules have to make sure that people have an equitable position within the commons, they have access to the resources. And here um, you see that there's rules um, that have to make sure that the resources are managed efficiently and used efficiently. Now this one is actually, the utility part is actually extremely important because that's what motivates people to contribute to the commons to, or to free write. And when resources decrease because, for example, bad weather um, or, or flood on, on the pasture land, this can have several effects. Decreased utility, can, so shrinking resources and reduced amount of resources can actually lead to uh, decreased utility. So people find it less interesting to use the common, so they, they may, might not be interested to follow the rules. If there's not enough pasture land for everyone to pasture their cattle, they might be tempted to overuse the common. Also, it might have an effect on the efficiency, on the, uh, on the efficiency of the management of the resources. Um, so it might have actually um, lead to, to overuse there too. Now, as I just said, you see crisis all the time but you also see continuous adjustment of the rules they have to uh, regulate access management, uh, monitoring and, and resource use. You see for these eight cases in the Netherlands, you get an overview of, of the new rules or the re repeated or adjusted rules they had for eight cases. Um, and you see that basically commoners continuously um, adjusted the rules they were making. And so basically, uh, they, they might have responded to one of these crises, but they constantly adjusted their, their, their use rules, their member rules, etc. I'll give a few examples later on about that too. Now, when we analyze these, uh, these sets of rules, and we've done so for three countries, UK, the Netherlands and Spain, uh, within the MIDI project with colleagues from Sweden and elsewhere in the Netherlands, uh, when we manage, uh, when we um, uh, look at the long-term evolution of the rules they develop, we came up with something uh, quite interesting. When we compare the evolution of the types of rules uh, within commons for, for various cases across the Netherlands and UK, we find for uh, both countries a U-shaped dynamics, we call it, meaning that they're stronger regulation activity at the beginning of a, the formation of a new common and at the end of a common. So what we, what we probably witness here is that commoners come up with new rules in the beginning, they have to, they, they start from scratch. But at the end we see a sort of struggle for life. They get pressure from the government to dissolve. And these, the, the, the end of these institutions are, are actually, um, uh, are basically the periods when they, they uh, start dissolving top down, uh, so the, this new legislation, and they start fighting against that legislation by reorganizing internally. And um, we see a sort of growth of the primarily administrative um, regulation they come up with. And they send out a lot of obligation um, rules. Uh, so they, people have to, uh, uh, well, they, they have to follow some specific rules. It's not a uh, permission rules or prohibition rules, as we call them, but they have to um, follow certain rules in order basically to save the common from also being dissolved by the government. It doesn't work in the end. They are dissolved. Um, 
So that's when you see the, 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 the end of those, those columns. Now, what is interesting in this graph is that you see similar trends for both countries, whereas they are quite different in terms of legal system. In the Netherlands, we find more autonomously, so more self-governed commons, whereby farmers uh, basically decided they're on their own rules without much interference of the local lords. In the UK, there's much more interference of the, the landlords and the, uh, the design of the rules. But still, we find the same struggle for life um, at the end of the commons. So we do see stress and in the end, they are indeed dissolved. Now another, uh, so th this stress could be also caused by natural resource uh, problems and uh, lesser uh, resources being available, as I just explained in the beginning, and uh, with the utility. Now, what we've done, at, well, Amina Gorbane from Delft University uh, did this part of the research. Uh, she studies on the basis of agent based modeling as she tries to um, test some hypotheses and tries to find out to what extent natural resource stress or social stress in the form of taxation. Um, had an impact on the dissolution of these commons. What she found is very interesting. Um, basically, she first started uh, implement, implementing environmental shocks by, um, well, by reducing the available amount of resources. But this didn't really have an effect on the institution of change that we were observing before. So there was no real uh, long-term effect. Now, when she introduced uh, show, social shocks, in the form of taxation, then we did see the same U-shape that is um, well parallel to what we found in the historical data. So basically, a shock in resources does not have the same effect, um, but it's a, a shock, a social shock. To me, as a historian, this was not really a surprise to see this effect, but it's uh, really fascinating. I think that um, commoners are apparently better capable of dealing with natural resource, resources, shocks of that as uh, in comparison to sh social shocks um, or possibly uh, economic shocks. Okay, um, thinking about crisis and how um, external factors may have an impact on the emergence or the dissolution of commons. Um, well, that also leads us to the question, what makes commons more resilient over time? Well, to start with, it's about designing good and adapt good, adaptable, changeable rules. And I've shown you before how rules were constantly adapted throughout the history of long living commons. And this is a really particularly nice example to show how they managed um, to manage to prevent a crisis on the commons, to prevent overuse in the long term of depletable resources. In this particular case, you see uh, the way in which they dealt with peat. It's, it's just one example of a common in the Netherlands, whereby you see here the number of units that each user, each member of the commons could take. You see it clearly declining over time, meaning that they realized that uh, the amount of deplete, they, the amount of peat they still had was depleting over time, of course it wasn't renewing fast enough, so they had to reduce the number of um, peat pieces per uh, member. Underneath, you see that they were constantly adapting rules in general, but also coming up with new rules to prevent further depletion of the peat and new sanctions attached to it. Now, the level of the fines you could get when you were sanctioned were going up and down all the time. And this sort of shows a, a sort of, uh, well, a trial and error phase in coming up with the right level of the fine. You can't put it too high because people won't pay it because nobody can pay it. You can't put it too low because then people will be, um, will be free riding all the time. So they were searching for the right level of the fine all the time, but um, clearly busy with trying to prevent overuse of their natural resource. Now, um, adjustable rules are one of the things that um, can help to increase the efficiency in um, resource use when there is external pressure or internal pressure when your resources are depleting. Uh, another important element, which I won't say much about here, it's not at all, but what we also found is that sanctioning was actually not always present when they designed a rule. Um, 
actually in nearly half of the sanctions in the Netherlands, and nearly half of the rules in the Netherlands never had a sanction. So what they did instead of um, threatening with a sanction was uh, making sure people were attending meetings and making sure they internalized the rules. So giving them a say, uh, so an, an equitable position within the, uh, the institution uh, delivered more uh, resilience than actually coming up with sanctions. Another thing I will not discuss here, but which uh, turned out to be the case is that when the common um, had more resources, um, different types of resources uh, available for its members, this also had an effect, a positive effect on the resilience of the common. So if a common only had pasture land, commoners would, well, at some point, maybe they didn't have cattle that year, so they would not be interested in the common anymore. They might start um, putting cattle from other people, which was prohibited on the common. So they start free riding. Now, if you have multiple resources, apparently commoners are willing to not use that type of resource they can't use, for example, the pasture land for one year, but they do use the woodland and other types of uh, resources. So multiple resources, having them in one uh, institution is good for its resilience. What we also see, is, and remember the, the, the figure I showed, whereby uh, the commons were dissolved uh, all at once, or more or less in the same period, we see that um, a common is more vulnerable, uh, that can be well managed and resilient as an organization itself, but when it's not um, collaborating with other um, commons, then you see that it becomes very vulnerable. It becomes very vulnerable for top-down dissolution efforts, like we've seen in the 19th century. So the point Lynn Ostrom was trying to make about nested enterprise, I think that's a very valid one here. So when they're, they're part, so they have to be connected to the local system, but ideally they're also connected to each other to form a network and to prevent a top-down dissolution. So what are the lessons we've learned so far? Um, if you look at the uh, very long-term development of commons, you see that they emerge after intensified periods of uh, population, population growth, more stress on resources, and they actually function also today as a sort of early warning system for a potential crisis. And we've seen them coming up uh, in the past um, decades also before the financial economic crisis, um, commas being set up by citizens who thought that, you know, they had to change the system. Um, they did not agree with the way um, resources like care were provided. They set up their own commons, so to speak. And that uh, you see actually in the whole wave developing before the crisis. It's not necessarily a reaction to the crisis, but they also come up, already come up before the crisis. Now it takes a long time to build up a movement of these ICAs. So we've seen that, you know, you, before the saturation point um, is reached in an area where, where you see a lot of people being involved in, in, in such an institution, it takes a long time, it takes a lot of effort for citizens. But when they do not connect to each other, they can be dissolved very quickly. So the, the whole effort they've done can be done with within a few decades where it can take maybe even centuries to set up a good functioning ICA. Now, what we see today is that um, many ICAs across Europe are not following the early modern strategy anymore. They're actually working together, they're networking and they're lobbying for their survival. So, um, I think they've actually learned what without probably realizing, but they've actually learned something from early modern history that they should change their um, their strategy in order to survive. What we also saw is that there's actually very little impact of all sorts of crises on the commons themselves. They managed to survive those, and they do so by adjusting their rules continuously. Now, lastly, I would also try to I would like to see look a bit forward. Um, to think what our knowledge about commons and what the present day situation could uh, mean for the future of the commons of similar types of institutions, um, well, long after the crisis has hopefully uh, passed and COVID-19 has become history. I want to look a bit on the bright side and try to think of the positive side effects that might be of it. Now, potentially, we're going to see a lot of, well, potentially, it's already happening, in fact, a lot of uh, people becoming 
unemployed, we probably will see more people become um, become unemployed and have to live off income pooling, of bringing together gigs of all sorts of types. So, so as people already have been doing via a platform such as Uber, Airbnb, and Deliveroo. Now, um, as we all know, they are not the most supportive for um, well, social security, et cetera, um, of, these, of their employees who usually are not even employees. Um, but possibly in the future, we might see parallel to this development also the further development of what we call um, platform cooperatives. And they have been developing quite rapidly over the past, um, well, past five years, a bit more maybe we'll see a further development of those. And those are actually online forms of cooperatives which um, provide social security and other services to members uh, of the cooperative. Another side effect might be that uh, there might be a rise on uh, worker cooperatives. We see that already a lot of companies are in trouble and they're trying to look for new sources of capital of an investment. Whereas on the other hand, we also see that a lot of people gain more responsibility for their own work, work or higher sense of ownership of their own work. So this actually may also lead to a development which is still very small, but has been going on for a while already in Europe, whereby, um, for example, family, uh, family businesses are turned into worker cooperatives owned by their employees. That's another a, a possibility that might take place over the, over the future. And then the last one, uh, which might be a consequence of what I started uh, saying about the deglobalization uh, development. Um, we also see a growing popularity of short chain um, production in different types, but uh, for example, most recently in agriculture has been very clearly visible in um, European economy. And you also see a sort of localization, so globalization of a lot of uh, services. So people want to bring back uh, the production of um, all sorts of products to a more local uh, base. Um, well, maybe this also leads to a higher consumer awareness about the societal impact of uh, consumer behavior. And it might also have the effect that there might be more consumer co-ops in the future or combinations of consumers and producers working together, consumers controlling the quality of the products they're buying. These are just some afterthoughts I would like to share, uh, which might give some counterweight to the current more negative developments we are already witnessing. I'm going to end here and I hope you enjoyed listening and I'm ready to take some questions. Great, that was, that was wonderful, Tina. Um, very much enjoyed that. While, while our attendees are putting, on, uh, putting in their questions, um, let, me, let me just start with a couple I had. A uh, question for you, when you talked about the difference between social and environmental shocks, um, I was wondering how you place something like, like our current uh, crisis in that we start with, with COVID, we start with a virus, but then we have all of these other issues coming in, the, the crashing economies, the, the um, the protests that have come out, not directly because of COVID perhaps, but, um, but all coming together. Um, and I was wondering how you would, as a historian, how you would classify something like, like this. Mm. It's a tough one. Well, I mean, some of the effects, of course, already build on, on the previous crisis, on the more economic crisis. So the effect we see today of the COVID, um, COVID-19 uh, as a disease, which has, well, demographic effects, um, they clearly also have a social dimension, right? The social dimension being that, um, well, inequality plays a role in the degree to which you're, you're vulnerable to, so, to, to die from COVID or to become, even become ill. So I think um, it's, it's hard to distinguish the effects of various crises and it, it's simply building up. Um, at the same time, I think we also see that there's, there is a counter movement and apparently it, it was, this second crisis was needed, um, so to speak, uh, in order to, 
really talk about transitions. You know? So I'm, I'm not sure how this is taking place in the US. I think it's probably a different world altogether. But in Europe, there is quite a substantial movement of people who, well, are at least hoping, but also working on uh, the transition towards, well, different type of economy. Um, it's probably wishful thinking that it might happen, but at least uh, I think we need to explore uh, the various types of, um, of organizations like the like uh, like these institutions for collective action in between uh, fully market organized uh, economy or fully uh, free market and um, yeah I, I'm, I'm not convinced that they that these connectivities can solve all of these problems of course I mean um, we've seen the importance of a good coordination mechanism on the state level for a crisis like this um, we, you see when the countries where they have it, they actually are capable of dealing with the consequences, but well, we also see what happens when you don't. Um, so I'm not, I'm not convinced that care cooperatives, for example, would be able to care, to, to deal with a COVID-19 crisis, not at all. You need a, a bigger coordination mechanism for that. Um, but definitely they, they are more capable of organizing care um, in some areas in the Netherlands and elsewhere in Europe um, than through the privatized system as we have it today. I'm not sure that's a very adequate answer to your question. It's a, it was a big question. Yeah, no, that helps quite a lot. Thank you, Tina. Um, we also have a question here for, uh, for the non-historians. Uh, you refer to the great reclamation. Um, could you uh, briefly uh, explain what that is to to those uh, um, uninformed? Oh well, the reclamation period. Um, it's a, the Great Reclamation Period is a period between well, let's say from the year thousand until twelve hundred, when you see a lot of air, agriculture areas um, in Europe being uh, reclaimed, basically turned into cropland to agriculture land in order to feed a growing population. Um, you see a similar trend also beginning of the 19th century and actually quite a few of the laws that dissolved uh, or aimed at dissolving the commons in the 19th century were so-called reclamation laws and they were intended to reclaim the commons um, because they, they were usually the last remaining wastelands uh, in a village. Um, but the, 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 the important thing here is that um, if they would not have set up the commons as a sort of resource management system, then it's quite likely that, um, well, it, it, it wouldn't have, it, the, 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 the agriculture system itself would have collapsed most likely because um, the, the pasturing of cattle was vital in keeping up uh, the, the productivity of uh, the agriculture pr uh, products. Um, and they needed the commons, the collective pasture land to provide for the manure to um, increase the productivity of uh, cropland. So when you have a population growth and you start, this, uh, you start reclaiming land, you also have to make sure that you don't turn everything into agricultural land because you need the pasture land to you know, fertilize the agricultural land. There weren't any um, artificial, chemical, whatever fertilizers in those times. They only come in, they only start from the 19th century onwards with uh, such chemical fertilizers. So that, that's, you know, the, the, that period was, was really vital in changing the agriculture system, but still it didn't change that much that they could do without the pasture land and without good resource management of, of uh, the agriculture system. Otherwise it would have completely collapsed. But to some extent, thanks to setting up commons, they could manage to keep up with the population growth over time. Thank you, that helps. Um, we have a question about um, if you had any more thoughts on linkages yeah. or implications for climate change. Yeah, that's a big one, huh? Um, yeah, well, um, it's still, you know, if you look at the current development of, for example, energy cooperatives, um, which are fully aiming towards renewable energy, yeah, um, 
you see, for example, that those are popping up all over Europe and, and taking in a, an important position in moving the, uh, the energy transition forward. And for example, in Germany, they were absolutely vital in, uh, in, in uh, increasing the amount of energy created in a renewable way. It was it was started in, by the citizens and citizens operatives and not in any other way. Now, the question is um, whether this can um, you know this type of um, this type of setting up uh, collectivities to produce short chain goods or services like energy, whether that can actually uh, reduce uh, all the negative you know all the uh, the world. CO2, whatever, that, that, you know, all the negative um, effects and, and, and that lead to climate change. I'm not sure, but what I do know is that um, what I see actually happening right now in, in countries and in, in collectivities across Europe, whereby citizens get involved in the production uh, of energy, of food, of um, uh, in the, in the provision of uh, services like care, etc., that they're far more aware of the, the scarcity of the product they're dealing with. So they have to actually talk about uh, the degree to which they, they are entitled to use the resource. Whereas if you go to the market, you don't really have to have that discussion. You can just you know, use as long as you pay for it, of course. Um, so there's no limit to consumer behavior and there's no thinking about consumer behavior if you um, let everything run through the market. Whereas within these collectivities, you do see that there is a sort of um, consideration for the scarcity. And there's also a higher amount of solidarity. So people are also aware that um, some resources might be temporarily not available for them. Um, for example, a lot of people are share, share, uh, joining agriculture co ops these days whereby they have to learn, okay. Um, well, it's not the time for the cauliflower, so we're not having cauliflower this time. Um, whereas if you, you know, if you fly it over from elsewhere in the world, you're going to have cauliflower if you want it. So all these, these short chain collectivities, I would call them, do lead to more awareness, I think, of the scarcity of resources we have to deal with um, in order to prevent further climate change. But it might not be applicable for the whole of society. I, I mean, I think it might be, it might have a, a sort of effect on, on to what extent people are willing to take, uh, well, to reduce their um, consumer behavior. But um, I'm not sure if that will be enough. I'm, I, I really wonder. It's, uh, it's going to take a lot more, I'm afraid. Yeah, so following that, um, leads to the question of scaling up collective action, right? So um, how are climate clubs, for instance, uh, like villages sharing a pasture? How does this scale? How does scale up, right? Or, well, scaling, uh, scaling strategies are a um, very interesting one because um, also, you know, if, if this uh, if governments figure out that this is an interesting uh, thing you know, the citizens invest in these organizations. They try to, um, well, if they, they support these organizations, they also want them to scale up. Um, what we notice currently today is that many of these organizations, they do want more members to some extent, but they don't want to grow eternally, and they rather um, set up a new cooperative instead of becoming too large. And you also notice that all these uh, smaller collectivities today really choose to form a network instead of becoming very large organizations, as we saw in the, in the previous wave of uh, ICs. Now, I, I think that's a very interesting um, evolution because when we look at the previous um, wave of institutional collective action, we see that collectivities became very large, massive organizations. We still have quite a few of them around in Europe, whereby cooperatives have uh, hundreds of thousands of members, but they are not connected to the initial values of the cooperative anymore. Um, whereas you see today that these new connectivities don't really choose not to do that. 
they want to uh, become larger by uh, rather helping another collectivities to set up um, and instead of becoming larger themselves. Now this of course also um, might influence their um, survival. To what extent can you really survive if you're not large enough, if you don't have enough people uh, joining your initiative and we'll, we'll see in the future to what extent this has is a threat to to these organizations but um, I see yeah I see quite a bit of difference between uh, times between centuries in terms of uh, scaling strategies so I think we have time for one final question here's an interesting one uh, that's come in it says um, Demographics over time were um, impacted by things like the plagues in the in the Middle Ages. So, are the commons an indirect outcome of the plagues? Do you think? No, not at all. Uh, no, that's the whole thing. We don't really see an effect of of those demographic shocks really on the emergence or the solution of of these commons. One way or another, they were capable of dealing with these shocks. And we know on the on the very basic level, if we look at the, the rules of these commons, we see that they came up with adjustments to their rules to make sure that they had, for example, when there was a demographic shock, that it, their common didn't dis, uh, disappear. And it's not just a matter of avoiding overuse, but also underuse. Huh? Uh, for example, I, I remember a case whereby there was a, a huge, it was a cattle plague. So half of the village was without cattle after, after the cattle plague. So there wasn't enough grazing being done on the common. So they allowed others who were not members to take part in, in, in the system, charged them a far too high price, but they would, were allowed to raise their cattle on the common. And that way, the upkeep of the, of the pasture land was being done. So they, they changed the rules, they adjust the rules when needed. And in that way, they can actually survive for centuries. So, um, yeah, I think um, there's, um, there, there can be a, a demographic effect, but the question is, how do you translate it in, the, uh, in a rule? How do you adjust your rules to the new situation? And we actually find a lot of proof that these commoners in the early modern period were very capable of dealing with external shocks uh, that they, they, they were capable of being resilient um, even under severe demographic uh, shocks on you know, very bad weather, bad, bad harvest, etc. So that, that's, I think that's a very, um, well, an important thing to realize that um, with regulation you can adapt behavior to such an extent that people also in, in more dire periods um, do not leave uh, the common and, and um, manage to survive in, in the long term. Um, of course, we, we didn't check for every uh, crisis. And of course, there is potentially also sort of bias in our data in the sense that we might, there might have been commons that dissolve because of a crisis that we did not find in the records anymore. But we also find many examples, many, many examples of commons that did survive many types of crisis by adjusting their uh, regulation. So it's all in the rules, I would say. Great, this was wonderful. Tina, on behalf of all of us, thank you so much for, for taking the time to share with us today. This was a, a enlightening discussion. I, I very much appreciate it. And I'd like to thank all of our attendees for, for joining us um, today and look forward to seeing you next time around. Thanks very much. Thank you for listening. Bye.